Hey guys, welcome to The Rollout. I'm Lindsay Rousseau. And I'm Genevieve Marie. Hello and welcome. All right. Well, uh, let's just dive in. So, you know, we've been doing a lot of reviews lately because a lot of really exciting stuff has been coming out that we're trying to keep up with. And uh, the latest thing that we have that dropped on Netflix was The Witcher Nightmare of, Nightmare of the Wolf. I can speak today. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's like a little anime movie that they're using as, you know, a buffer between seasons one and two of The Witcher show, which I think we're getting season two in November, we think. No official release date yet, but that's what we're suspecting. Right. So, um... This movie follows uh, the Witcher Vesemir, which, as we know, is um, Geralt's, uh, Geralt's Geralt. teacher, mm -hmm. and um, it also explains the fall of Kaer Morhen, which we haven't seen in the show yet, the live action, no. but this is obviously leading up to the se season two, in which we're right. going to probably finally see Kaer Morhen and in the state that we see it in in the game. Right. And I thought that this movie was particularly interesting just because of how they approached it, because I right. feel like, I don't know about you, Lindsay, but I feel like they came at it with more of an eye for the book series and the game yes. rather than what um, what the show presents. Well, and the one thing I have to say that I really love about the show because I've read all the books I absolutely love the Witcher books and you know I, I've, I've tried diving into the comic books I'm not as a big a fan of the comics as I am the original source books well they're and a bit one of the Witcher healthy. pulls why. yeah season one of the Witcher pulls directly from you know his first book but the book was you know his his it was a collection of shorts that he'd written originally written for you know fantasy magazines and it stayed really true to that and so you know, the fact that we had a writer who was one of the writers on the TV show penning the script for this and then basing it off, you know, they, they've done a really good job of trying to stay true to the original source material. But then, like you said, while the TV show Witcher says it has nothing to do with the video games, it doesn't pull on that at all. We did kind of get a hint of that in this movie. Right. And I think that maybe they're taking a cue from fans here because of the fact that there were a lot of things that kind of got glossed over in the TV show. I will admit that the timeline of the TV show, the timeline of events and the politics in particular, and just basically how the world is kind of set up, if you don't really know that, know what all those things are going yeah. in, the TV show can get very confusing to people yeah. if they don't have a background in what it's kind of like Harry Potter where yeah. if you don't know if you're not in the in group if you haven't read the books then there's going to be a lot of things right. that are going to kind of go over your head well and then and jumping like, around time time wise also could be confusing to people because it wasn't until like episode four that you realize oh we've been going back and forth in time okay Right. And this movie, actually, I feel it fills in a lot of gaps. Mm -hmm. it, this movie actually does quite a lot of things. And it is very impressive to me personally. I think it's very impressive with all the things and points it's able to hit on and as well as being able to convey to the audience what the what the world of The Witcher is like, yeah. what the politics of The Witcher of you know, the world in The Witcher is like, um, yeah. who the characters are, um, where witchers come from. I thought that was very interesting that yeah. they touched on that. And they didn't go into great detail, but like they they did the show don't tell thing, which I think well, is I think that's, far better I than- That's because in season two, because we're getting the training of Siri to become a witcher, I suspect they're setting that up and we're gonna see a lot more about the trials and everything that goes into training a witcher in that. And so I think this was giving us a taste of that. Right. So, um, we're going to get into spoilers. Yeah. Um, spoilers, so yes. Yeah. We're going to get into now. spoilers right now. So if you have not seen the movie and you do not want uh, any spoilers, you know, you can click off here. Although I don't really know why you're tuning in to a right. talk about this show. 
And it's been in the books and it's, you know, it's been out. Yeah, it's in the books. It's it's everywhere. Yeah. Um, and not the storyline. Okay. Um, but yes, yeah, spoilers are coming. So basically, um, I wrote a little breakdown that divided <laughs> that divided my uh, personal feelings into what the show got right and yeah. what the show got wrong. And personally, I think that there were a lot of things that the show got right versus yeah. what the show got wrong. Absolutely. And the things that they it got wrong, well, not all of them, but a couple of them can almost be chalked up to personal preference. But right. yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll go into oh, a little yeah. depth about that too. All right. So let's, I'm just going to go down my bullet points. Um, yeah. The voice cast, let's start with that. What it got right. I, the voice cast was amazing. Yeah. And I was Lindsay, blown away. You can probably speak more to this than me. Yeah. I mean, I obviously, of course, the first thing I did was IMDb this. And, you know, number one, they brought Theo James back, who played young, who played Vesemir in the Witcher TV show. So they brought him back. You know, our main leading people are some heavy hitters in 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 film and television. You know, Mary McDonnell was Lady Zerps, Laura, uh, Laura Pulver was Tetra, um, Graham McTavish was Deglin. So those were all amazing actors already. And then they had some of the best of the best in the voice actor world. So this show, because a lot of times we talk here about how you know, celebrity casting, sometimes there's a loss in performance when it comes to voiceover. But here we had some of the top VO actors in this movie as well. We had Jennifer Hale, who is my idol, uh, playing um, Ilyana. Carrie Walgren was in it. Um, you know, uh, we had Dee Bradley Baker. We had Courtney Taylor, Fred Tattashore. Um, you know, it just, uh, David Arrigo. We had some people who I obviously, some I consider friends, but who are, in my opinion, some of the best voice actors in this industry. And so I think the show did a great job of, yes, using those celeb talents for the headliners, but then bringing in solid, solid actors to fill out the rest of the cast. And I think it really showed. Yeah, no, there was not one point in it where I felt like you had an extra from the Dark Knight moment. Right. <laughs> I, everybody brought their A game. Nobody's like the director's nephew wasn't brought in to, you know, <laughs> throw him a thing. It was great. I really yeah. enjoyed it. I thought that there was a lot of color and just wonderful emotions, you know, being conveyed through. Um, yeah. I mean, the acting was, and this is why we love the Witcher TV show. And obviously it's gotten a lot of blowback in that it is very grounded and gritty. And, you know, um, a lot of interviews have been given on how, you know, they actually removed a lot of the dialogue that Geralt said because Henry Cavill was like, mm, he wouldn't talk that much. He'd do it in an expression. Well, you can't do that with a TV, with a movie, an animated movie. So there was more dialogue in this than like the TV show. But the acting was still the right. It was solidly grounded. Nothing seemed over the top. I mean, I really believed all of these emotional moments that were going on. You know, the love yeah. between Vesemir and Ileana came through really beautifully. Right. And also, I mean, Geralt is he's <laughs> he's a special type of person, like not everybody is going to have that, you know, that stoicism. Yeah, that no, Vesemir was definitely it, much it is more very particular flamboyant. to that character, I will yeah, say. Yeah, And Vesemir definitely is more of a jabber mouth, especially even in the games. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I was very impressed with the voice cast they had. That also, their star-studded voice cast might also explain a point in which I was... I'm going to say that what it got wrong, mm -hmm. um, but maybe we should just go through all the things that I oh, let's, do, let's do that. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, we just, we just started touching on the writing, obviously great actors right. can do a lot, but great writing helps. Yeah. There, the, the author, the, um, the screen, the screenplay writer just did such an amazing job of not just telling us a good story, um, that a good fantasy story, because that is also very hard to get right as well. But he, uh, who, who is it? Uh, it is a guy, right? Uh, the writer. Yes. Yeah. It was, a uh, Bo DeMeo. 
Okay, yeah. Who, well, did, write, who did write on the What's Your TV show as well. Right. Bo, may I call you Bo? Can I call you Bo? Bo. <laughs> I'm going to call you Bo. Bo really understands the world of The Witcher. I mean, going beyond just the live action TV show that he wrote for, but he really dug deep into both the RPG and the books. And he clearly mm -hmm. understood exactly how this world works. Like it, it hinges on the politics of humans versus the elves and any non-human characters. It really hinges on the politics yeah. of things. It really hinges on the gray morality of all of the characters that are in, yeah. that are in the movie, that are in the books. Like I just, it was great. And yeah. from the very first scene, I knew that it, that they were going to get the majority of this right, yeah. because it really sums up the beginning scene really sums up the world of the Witcher because right. you have this human boy and he is urinating on an elven shrine while singing a folk song mm -hmm. that foreshadows the events of the film. So you have right. right there, you have humans disrespecting, you know, the elven race. Right. Uh, you have you know, the folk songs going through it. And so you know that this is, you know, a, a, a fantasy that is like, gra that's grounded in yeah. kind of this D&D &D type world, you know, where yeah. all of these races are living together and, you know, there there's tension there. Yeah. Cause they and, haven't really explored that in the TV show yet, but it is very pronounced in the books. Like there oh, is yeah. so much hatred between humans and elves or the old races or however you want to refer to them, you know, and as the books go on, we start learning about the elvish resistance organization and we get Milvia who, you know, it's this, there's, and we start to get that in this movie, which right. I'm, again, I'm hoping it's teasing season two. Right. The humans are, well, basically what happens is that the humans are able to defeat the elves in a huge battle and then continue uh the genocide of you know non-human races but then after that after they're able to defeat the elves and there's a ton of infighting between the humans themselves and the king and the human kingdoms and that in on its own is very interesting yeah um, well this even goes into you know and we see the tension about the witchers as well because it's like oh, yeah. oh witchers are not human what are they they're monstrosities right. they're they're abnormal they're you know they're uh they're mutants you know and so we see that as well that witchers are not necessarily liked right no no they're not and it's and that is very well <laughs> that that's very like a good example of how they show this is in the games where you know you'll come up in a town and nobody wants you there not one person though they will begrudgingly hire you most of the time and it is very rare that you roll into a village or a city and people are like hey yeah look it's a witcher he's very Yay, cool he's here to help us <laughs> he hey i can't wait and they call and they like call you a freak and say like tell you all the horrible things that they are going to do to you and right it is yeah it is very interesting so i'm um, moving on from, i yeah. mean from the with the great writing, I great writing. I mm -hmm. just, I just really loved how they handled things, and and the ending is actually very clever. Yeah, um, yeah. I thought the ending was very clever. I thought that, you know, they did a good job. I'm like, oh well, maybe <laughs> they give you just a second to kind of step out of the world of The Witcher and be like, well, maybe like this time there will be, you know, right. a semi good ending, like a bitter, like kind of a bittersweet ending. And it's like, no, yeah. nobody gets to be happy. I'm no. sorry. This no. is The Witcher, remember? Yeah, someone's <laughs> gonna either... die. We're gonna start messing with reality and, you know, yeah. Right, you either get brutally murdered or <laughs> you live on to be miserable. Right. And watch everyone else around you die. Right. Yeah. I, so I, I just thought, I thought that was great. I thought that little twist at the end was, you know, fun and inventive. And it was a great way to use magic, which I think yes. is 
often abused <laughs> right. in writing, especially in writing. Right. I mean, and again, if we go back to the original books, magic exists, obviously, but, you know, it's, it's only a certain few who can wield it. It's not mass, right. you know, mass, you know, only, you know, you got the few sorceresses who can do it, the witchers who can manufacture it and learn how to do a few things. Um, right. And then obviously Siri becomes the abnormal one who can start traveling through time and different, you know, dimensions and stuff. And she, she's an outlier, obviously. Um, but everything that they did magic wise in this, I was like, oh yeah, that was explained in the books. It wasn't anything that was crazy out of the ordinary. Like the right. teleportation circles are used extensively in the books. Like the fact that sorceresses can do that is something that's very unique about them. And they do use it as a battle technique, you know, sometimes. Exactly. And you see it in the, in the TV show as well. Yeah. The final you battle, the especially. Show, you have it in the game. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not something that was just like th comes out of left field right. out of nowhere. And it was really cool to actually see that in action, even though it was in animation form, sometimes things are better in animation form, because, to be honest. Yeah, it, it's um, not CGI. You can almost do more with it because it's just a part of the regular animation process. It's not some added VFX you have to add on later, you know? Right. Um, so my, my, next, my next point was that, uh, as we've been talking before, I mean, this, this movie really understands the politics of the Witcher um, and that politics is a central theme to especially, most especially the books and yeah. also in the game, like in the game, you know, they're, they're running through, but they kind of in the background in the live TV show, they're there, but again, um, if you don't have a background with either the book or the game, you're yeah, going to you get you a might little miss lost. It. Right, right. And by the time we get to the TV show, you know, Geralt, uh, girl is essentially the last witcher. And so here we're able to see in the heyday, you know, by then, like the elves are completely almost in hiding and yeah. Right. Um, so, and, and it, as we were saying before that, you know, this film really did show us the social and political relations between humans and non-human factions. And when I say non-human, I mean everything from witchers to elves um, to, uh, you know, other species, dwarves, all of, all of the things that are not human. Right. Uh, and I thought that was, that was really good because it, it's such an important thing to get across to the audience because many of these stories, a lot, a lot of the subplots, like the main plots and the subplots really have that thread of, um, of politics and, you know, social relations running yes. through it. Right. Um, exactly. It has a lot to do with race. It has a lot to do uh, with gender. Social class. Absolutely. Especially in the books. Gender is a huge thing. It really is. Yeah. Um, yeah. Gender and, uh, you know, uh, freedom of choice. Uh, that, that is a absolutely huge thing, especially for Siri. Um, oh, for Siri. And then once we, I mean, and I was blown away because again, these books were written in the eighties and nineties and, and, you know, I don't know if it's like book four or whatever, but when we get Milvia in the group, you know, she joins Geralt and the group of them. And at one point she gets pregnant and they start having a conversation about abortion, at which point Geralt says to the group of men talking, this isn't our job. This isn't our choice to make. This isn't our decision. It's not our body. And I was like, holy fuck, a Polish guy in like 1990 was writing about a woman's right to choose. Like, so, you know, again, going back to the original source material, like he was creating strong, powerful female characters back when it wasn't trendy. And I hate to say trendy because it should just be a thing. Um, and that still comes through, you know? Right. Um, and so, yeah, that was one of the things that I, I really liked that they, you know, got right and they made clear. And I, I really don't think that it would have been as good as it was without our main villain character yeah. and how she was written and portrayed. Like oh, Tetra, yeah. Tetra was so good because, because of the fact 
that we know that she has she, we know that she has bad morals she has bad yeah. motivations but so many of the other characters in the witcher in this movie in particular also have bad yes. like also have evil or bad or right. gray, questionable or morally yeah. gray motivations but they explain it she's not just like evil for the sake of evil like we learn why she's doing the things she's doing and that right. kind of makes sense from a certain point of view <laughs> a certain point of view uh which i will also i also really wanted to touch on that too um that you know this this villain tetra i mean she's the main villain and the villain wasn't actually the monster and no. in the witcher usually the monster never is the main villain yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and it really shouldn't be uh the it's monster usually people should not be the main abusing villains. their power yeah it's usually people abusing their powers right it's usually always a human character um it's because the monsters in this the monsters in the witcher uh for me they're i mean you do have your creepy ghoulish yeah. villains i you have your creepy ghoulish monsters but the ones that they actually like center a story around the ones that you actually you know get well, to talk yeah like the you whole, know, get to grapple with right are actually quite sad well the whole um, story around renfrey is like absolutely devastating i mean this poor girl at like 13 her mom works with a sorcerer to like convince her that you know they have to kill her because she was born under a bad moon and a curse and so they send her off to die and then the guy like tries to rape her and she kills him and this puts her on a whole path towards vengeance and revenge and then you get the whole Geralt you know Geralt saying well you know I can't choose a side and you're like but no there is a bad and there is a good you can't just be neutral so I mean it's interest Geralt <laughs> humans are the worst in this show a lot you know it's Lord Geralt <laughs> Yeah. I love how that's kind of almost everybody's takeaway. Well, not everybody. Everybody who has a wrong takeaway of The Witcher is like, yeah, yeah, I'd rather not choose. Right. It's like, oh, right. God damn it, people. That's not <laughs> yeah. what you were supposed to. If, if Geralt came to that realization that like between like the greater evil and the lesser evil, I'd rather not choose. If that was the end of his character arc, we would not have a oh, TV show. We wouldn't it care. would have ended. I would have turned the first yeah. episode. Yeah. Like, oh, well, Garrett was always right and he doesn't need to learn a thing. But then he does. <laughs> In which the show. Is, yeah. God. But yeah, but point being, usually the, the most evil people or questionable people are the one are, are humans, are humans who either abused their power or magic or you know, in her case, you know, she had a traumatic child. You know, her parents were murdered. So you can kind of see where she's coming from. Right. I and as I was saying, the the monsters from The Witcher, the ones that you get to know, like the werewolf in the game, like the werewolf right. in the game, and you know, the the people that like get turned into monsters, and right. even in the movie where you have um the elven woman who is mutated um exactly to become um uh, you know to become a monster um they're usually more cloaked in this sort of gothic novel like sadness this dreariness this mm -hmm. um this kind of where you feel you feel bad for them you know they're pe they're things to be pitied they're not things to be you know hateful towards right and that's that is what makes them not main villain material you know right. they're the cautionary tale or they're you know they're the thing in which you know the moral comes out it's i and i really like that about the witcher um especially in this movie mm -hmm. because tetra is a person of great power right who can manipulate the populace and she can also manipulate the king who I yep. love that they made the king just this ineffectual, such an idiot yeah. out of his mind. Like doesn't he give, isn't even he's not even king. No, he's like he's looking himself like, in the mirror yeah. and like, he's just okay. like I don't know. I, it's you two fight over this, the this right. is council crap. And she is able because of this, because of her ability 
to manipulate. She's able to do what supremacists do best. Yeah. And that's use people's fear of the other to push yeah. her agenda. And usually that is a huge thread that yeah. runs through the Witcher is supremacy, is supremacy able to come out on top, able to right. have the agenda pushed because they use people's fear of the yeah. other, aka the right. monsters, monsters, the, the mutants, elves, the, yep. the witchers, anything that is not human. They're right. able to villainize them and then be able to get what they want out of that. Right. Because then the masses turn and, you know, yeah. yeah. And you see that obviously like, you know, when they have the confrontation in the bar between the Witcher and the Knights and like the Witchers obviously have no respect for the Knights because they're pussies apparently in their mindset. And then the Knights, like it is their honor. They are duty bound to, you know, fight the Witchers. And of course, who's the ones that get arrested? It's the Witchers who get arrested. And if it wasn't for Ileana pleading them, you know, for them, it's like, but you're, you're seeing this tension just palpable throughout. Right. I mean, I just, I just find it interesting that a lot of the times it can get lost. I mean, I think this is a lot uh, more easy to do if you've just played the game, but mm -hmm. a huge part of the Witcher is how humans push racial supremacy yeah. through systemic raci racism and through genocide. Yeah. Uh, and I really do like that this movie kind of really touches on it and really yeah. makes that central to the storyline. Absolutely. I mean, and this was absolutely an adult movie. Like the yeah. fact oh, that God. this is animation or anime, please do not mistake this for a children's show because we have a bloody arm within like oh. the first five minutes of the movie or something. Right. Like there is a lot of death. There's a lot of gore. So we, we, even, get we even get naked Geralt, or not Geralt in this case. We even get a naked Vesemir. I mean, you know, backside only, but um, they weren't afraid to go there. Like yeah. and hit An all those dark, family dark. gets dusted ripped apart ripped apart the first five minutes mm -hmm. so yeah they go they full they go full castlevania on, yeah on the on this whole thing where it's just like nope pulling no punches it's all gonna We're die gonna show you the gore in the beginning yeah uh, so but you can't have know, the witcher without the gore i don't think like you, it just wouldn't it wouldn't be the witcher anymore it would just be another no. pg-13 fantasy film you know yeah no it's this is not appropriate <laughs> for uh no, for the young ones yeah no please yeah yeah um, and then i just again the last thing for tetra is just i love that she's not this mustache twirling villain you even get an entire scene where she and vesemir are fighting together and yeah. they they're working together and i find that very interesting because they're able to come to kind of an impasse you know they, yeah. they're able to be able to kind of put up with each other yeah there's mutual easy. respect there for each other's skills and right exactly but she still pushes her agenda she still yeah. doesn't see the witchers as people she doesn't right. see you know she still doesn't see elves as people <laughs> she yes, very much threat. does not have her mind changed as no. as she wouldn't spending only half a day with a witcher right you know yeah um and you know five seconds in a room with an elf she's she's not going to change her mind no um and i i just really like that and that even though you get to understand her motivations and she's also so subtle also up oh. until the point where she actually shows her true colors right. and like Towards the unleashes end. hell on Kier Morin. Right. And then the audience actually gets to understand her motivations, even if yeah. they're wrong. Right. I think that makes her a very strong villain. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, and all that being said, like we have a strong female antagonist. And this was another thing that we thought this this movie did really well is that again, the Witcher is still it's focusing on the boys and you know, Care Morn and everything. So it's obviously still more male dominant, but we had some really solid female characters in this. We did. Film. We um, almost had perfect almost, gender parity. Almost. Not quite. <laughs> 
Almost. But almost, you know. But so, I think we were talking about this we'll earlier, take actually, that it almost falls into the Bad Batch trap where right. you have this group of it, you have this group that is male only written into your story right which is the witchers um you and you know, have to find a way to pictures. female characters he in. is actually uh, an outlier yeah. in that regard um so <laughs> when you have this singular group that is the focus of the movie and it's all male it's really hard then because you kind of write yourself into a corner it's really exactly hard to include other genders and luckily they were smart enough to figure that out and they yeah. made the majority of the uh you know the majority of the non-witcher characters um women yeah uh, the main characters yeah. i should say now and, they and did I, a great job with it. I agree. I, I was surprised we didn't see more sorceresses because again, in the TV show and the books, the Council of Sorceresses is a really big deal. Their whole school where they train sorceresses is a really big deal in the books. Um, I think it probably would have been just too much to try and do both. Maybe yeah. we'll see this more in the TV show. But again, I have so much faith in this because going back to the source material and the games, women play such a prominent role in those books, you know, yeah. beyond just Siri and the, you know, the names that we know, they, they have a huge, huge presence in the books. And so I think they did what they could again, like you said, giving us a con a conceit where it is surround centered around men, but then giving us these solid female characters. Right. And in the books, as it is within this movie, I, I love the fact that they don't just give us, you know, well-rounded female characters without the actual struggles of being female. Right. Um, I, I really like that the writers are intuitive enough to include that in there and in a way that feels realistic, especially yeah. for the time period. Um, well, with Eliana. They're yeah, they're like, um, you don't you don't even deserve to be here. You didn't earn this. You got it because your husband died. And she's like, yeah, but I have made my mark known here, even if I inherited this role, you know? Right. And with this, with the Lodge of Sorceresses, it's exactly yeah. the same. They are, <laughs> they are mistrusted. Mm -hmm. basic they are mistrusted for many reasons but most on the surface because of the fact that they are a group of powerful women right um i mean of course they like like the sorcerers and so many other factions i mean they're just as bad as all the other factions like they're they're neither they're neither better nor worse um yeah. but they are singled out and i think again it's because they have so much power, so yeah. concentrated, you know, and especially the royalty is afraid of them. You know, each of them are, you know, essentially they're all trained to be counselors to the various kings in the, in the, in the lands. But you know those, and they always say how they are the actual rulers of the land. Yeah. Um, and I know, so it's like, you know, that these men, these powerful men are afraid of what these women can do. Right. And I mean, you obviously see that with Tetra because she got her way up, down and center. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she got her way. It took her a little bit, but uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she, did, um, she did it. Yeah. So uh, yay. All right. For better or for worse. Right. Right. Um, but then I also, the, the last thing that just like jumped out at me that I just thought was really cool um was the uh witcher who was an amputee who that dude was just kicking ass kicking ass with one hand just with one kicking hand. ass i loved it you know and we uh, haven't touched on this a lot lately we did have uh jennifer crutchmer on our show a while back mm -hmm. who you know the big thing she talks about is um you know representation of disability within the entertainment industry and that that side of things is still very, very underrepresented. You know, we've, we've got it yeah. this year, you know, like Titans this season, we do have a, you know, uh, um, a woman who is an amputee in a wheelchair. Um, but you know, we get a witcher without an arm. Right. Well, I mean, I also noticed that there were quite a few, um, you know, there was more than one, uh, yes. 
hero with a disability in this in this show i mean in this movie and it it didn't even need to it it went uncommented on as it should exactly um, and i just thought that was that was the one thing that i noticed that was just like oh yeah that stood out to me as being awesome yeah dude kicks so, ass <laughs> yeah yeah um, um but so, along the lines of representation um let's maybe let's start digging into what it got wrong moving into what it got wrong so the tv show i i give it props for you know i give it credit where credit is due it does have you know a good sprinkling of poc in its cast yeah. um but in this movie poc was present but yeah. they were all background characters and i yeah. mean I mean, they were powerful, you, you know, this takes place in Europe, but there are POC people, even, you know, there were POC people in Europe so long ago. So, so long <laughs> so ago. So long ago. The Silk Road, like, yeah, the Silk if Road. You thought that people were like not going back and forth, trading with each other, sharing ideas, you're absolutely out of your mind. So, yes. I do not accept the argument of, well, it takes place in Europe, so there would be no POC. Except it, let's just bring this back around to the fact that this is fantasy. Also, yes. So it's like the whole argument people made about Star Wars when we got Rose. They're like, there's no, there's no POC in space. And I'm like, we're talking about entire galaxies. If you want to tell me that it's all a bunch of fucking white people who colonized the entire galaxy. Like I call aliens. bullshit on that argument. I just call straight up bullshit. So yeah, anytime we're dealing with sci-fi and fantasy, it's like, obviously we are getting the, whether it's intentional or unintentional, but we're getting the, the built in mindset in which, you know, that the, the creators maybe unintentionally have and that, right. you know. Well, I mean, for for white creators, mostly the default is always going to be white. Lord of the Rings. And I, and this was just something that I noticed that I know other people are going to notice and comment on. And I don't really, I, I think maybe I'm not quite certain but I think Luca was, uh, I think Luca might have been Asian. I yeah, think. it was, um, it was it voiced by Matthew Yang King. Right. Uh, he exactly. is voiced by Matthew Yang King. So I think, I think, it's but I, I, you know, I can't be sure. Right. But any one, one does not make. And then the voice of young, the voice, voice of young Luca was Jennifer Kwan. So we're gonna we're gonna hope that yes that character was intended to be asian yeah so uh yeah uh that was just the one thing that i'm like other people are gonna notice this and you know it we need to we need to talk about we need to talk about the elephant in the room or the elephant that wasn't in the room um also unfortunately they kind of wrote themselves into a kill your gaze trope <laughs> Right. <laughs> Which was a little like, I have to admit, it stands out because a lot of people die in this movie. A lot of people yes. die, most notably witchers, which this person, the job, this person yes. was. Um, however, it's the first kind of major character death that you see in the movie. Right. And the character just so happens to also be gay. I'm, I'm hoping this was unintentional. I'm because I'm sure, again, oh, of course going it is. back it to the source, yeah, going back to the source material, they spend an entire book diving into series bisexuality. Exactly. You know, yes, she has exactly. a relationship with Missile, with another woman. So I am hoping this was not intentional. I well, of course, I actually really think that it wasn't. I think it was just one of those. He also just so happens to be gay. But like he also has a, you know, he, he also has a bigger role in the story. And unfortunately, uh, his story arc comes to an end um, by being executed um, yeah. as kind of um, to kind of show Tetra's, you know, um, master plan and, you know, to kind of like do the big reveal, of, yes. you know, the the greater 
plan at work. And so it just, again, it's kind of the same thing with uh, their like little bit of uh, the Bad Batch issue yeah. with, yeah. you know, the gender parity thing. But at the same time, you know, like it's there. So I thought I would make mention of it. Yeah. Um, uh, but I actually really did like that character. Not I sure really did do. He was very though. spunky. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kind of, I don't know about the hair or it was, know, the exact. Yeah, hair. there was definitely none of the traditional white witcher hair in this. Definitely stood out. The hair definitely stood out as being an, a, an interesting, maybe not my favorite choice, but it, that's neither here nor there. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, and then I think also the biggest thing, and this is what you yes. and I talked we about. We talked about this a while offline. Yeah. The biggest thing that we had an issue with was the character animation was yeah. just lacking. For it was us. just lacking. Yeah. I mean, and it became so abundantly clear because everything else was so solid nothing else was distracting me. You know, sometimes when I right. watch animation, I'm like, oh, okay, the voice acting bothered me or, you know, the writing bothered me. But in this case, that was also solid. And then I was like, something just wasn't sitting right with me with the film. And, and yeah, it, it boiled down to the character animation. It yeah, just, like, it didn't sit right with me. The environments are gorgeous. Oh, absolutely. The environments absolutely are very, gorgeous. very pretty, well planned out. Uh, they look great when you first see Care Morin. It does have this wonderful weight to it, and you know you feel the grandeur of seeing Care Morin for the first time. And but then the character animation, I honestly think, I mean Netflix definitely with their original uh, yes. cartoons, with their original animations, they all i believe most of them are done out of the same studio yeah i think they're uh, all they coming have, out of they south def, korea not, they definitely all have the same flavor right. to the animation well, and the, style. the director on this show has directed a lot of anime i mean um and not saying that's good or bad but you know he was behind voltron or not he wasn't a director on it but he worked on voltron and he worked on mortal kombat um yeah. So, but he, you know, he also worked on Legends of Korra and so, but right. an avatar. So yeah, it's just something about the Netflix animation style. Just, I don't Maybe. know if they're rushing it or so, what. I think it, I would, I said we were going to come back to it. Uh, we were going to come back to their star studded voice cast Yeah, and you know, their great writing cast. And it was, the fact is, is that maybe maybe they ran out of a time or maybe they ran out of money to kind of go over and do another pass because what I actually noticed with the character animation in this versus the character animation in um another Netflix original um animated series which is Castlevania mm -hmm. is that the shadowing is not quite there uh they needed to go a couple more passes over that and then the play with light is right. not quite there like shadow and light just they don't have they don't actually look like they are a part of the scenery yeah. they look like they were just kind of pasted on top of the scenery if you know what right. i mean there is no foreground you know, there's nothing happening in the foreground. There, there is no like sort of filter to kind of blend yeah. them all into the background and, yeah. and make them look like they belong. But that was that was just you know something that I was looking at and yeah. thinking. And I mean, maybe it's a time crunch thing. And it could have been. I mean, so this is Studio Mir. They're based in South Korea um, or Seoul, Korea, which is you know where some of you know it's the same studio that gave us legends of Korra, that gave us avatar so obviously the guy these guys know what they're doing yeah. you know I'm, we're not we're not saying that but yeah so i guess the show so this movie was announced in january of 2020 it was announced that this this film was going into production we're now in august of 2021 so that's a pretty short turnaround for an animated turnaround. feature. Yeah. I mean, yes, they probably were working on it before they announced it, but I mean, some animated 
you know, for a movie that's what, what was this an hour and a half, hour 45? I mean, to me, that seems like short turnaround. But again, we're we're kind of nitpicking here. Oh, but yeah. it did, no, it this did was just, just like it was gnawing in the back of my mind. It just it it just was a little off. And maybe it was a choice. Maybe right. they chose this style and maybe other things were at play, but you know, you take the movie as a whole. This was the one thing that kind of stood out to both of us. Yeah. Right. We are not at all saying that the animation was bad or that it was mediocre. We're just saying that compared to some of the other Netflix uh, animated series and films out there, there was something that just didn't hit quite as hard or as good as those other series as far right. as the character animation i'm speaking solely about the character animation yes not the environments yes exactly um, the environments were is absolutely it. beautiful yeah <laughs> we are huge avatar and legend of Korra fans and, oh, and we know that nasty. the studios that they're fantastic so they it was just a tiny little nitpick um yes. And yes. again, I blame, I honestly blame it on the fact that it, it just suffers. Let's blame it on COVID because I feel like we can just blame everything on COVID at this point. COVID. I'm guessing yeah. like, you know, the animators ended up having to work remotely and, you know, you know, having two roommates who are animators, that is not ideal. You can right. do it. You got your computer, but not being able to be there. And so again, we're just speculating here, guys. We don't know what happened. We don't know if anything happened, you know, right. but Yeah. And honestly, it's a filler film. It is. And for something that is technically a filler between, you know, season one and two of a show, just to kind of give the audiences something to, you know, cling on to and make them happy. This was a fantastic film. I actually really, really enjoyed it. I really liked it. I did too. It's, 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 it's easy to watch. If you already know a lot about The Witcher, if you don't know a lot about The Witcher, you can still watch it and not be explain some you won't be as confused as you might have been when you watched season one of the TV show. I think this explains things. So if you didn't understand season one of The Witcher, you can still watch and enjoy this film. If you like fantasy, you're still going to enjoy this film. Um, and then, yeah, if you are a Witcher fan of the books or the movies, you're going to get even more out of this and be excited about it. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm personally, I, and it's another, it's also one of those films that you can rewatch it. Like, I honestly am probably going to watch it again. Yeah. I could do a deeper breakdown of this entire film and, you know, all of the things that it's saying, but for now, like this, this is just our hot take. This is our uh, hot take. This is our, our our hot take. But yeah, and of course, we are excited about season two of The Witcher. Oh, so. we are so excited. I um, can't even. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So this is our hot take. Please let us know what you guys think that we got right, what we got wrong, what, what did you think that the movie got right, and what it got wrong. Yeah. Um, we'd love to hear. Let us know comments in the comments down below. below. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We are uh, trying to grow the channel, so if you guys could like and subscribe and ring that bell, even uh, stay till after and give us a little bit more of your time and watch the video that comes up next on our playlist, we would love that as well. Uh, you guys are amazing. Thank you for showing up and coming to watch every, yes. you know, every if we're listening to what we have to say, you know, two girls with some ideas. <laughs> yeah. So um, if you did like what we have, please like, subscribe. We upload every Friday at noon Pacific time. Uh, and we'd love to see you again. Uh, also, if you have suggestions for us uh, for our next shows, please write them down below. And we will see you next Friday. Bye, guys. All right. Bye.